Well, this is going to be 21 years in 15 minutes. So I anticipate that much of what you'll see, you will not have seen before. Well, the first thing is that these are the social determinants of health, uh, their economic and social conditions, but more importantly, they're about a decision a society makes as a whole about what is the rights of citizenship. First thing I always like to say is we've never been as wealthy as we are now. This is the gross domestic product. Frequently you hear, in a time of limited resources. No, there's no limited resources. There's never been as much wealth as there is now. The question is, how is it being distributed? And what is it being used for? Well, I got started all of this in the 1990s. Uh, I had moved up here in the 70s, and I quickly realized I wasn't in Kansas anymore. But then the 1990s came along, and uh, my students have no idea who these two guys are. Hopefully you do. And we made a decision as a society, starting in 1991, that there wasn't really a role for government anymore. And in fact, not only did we reduce federal and provincial spending, but in the House of Commons, this was seen as a great achievement. That spending is now at 1950s levels, and people got up and applauded that. Well, how did you accomplish that? How do you suddenly reduce government spending? You cut billions of dollars from the taxes of the wealthy and corporations. 10, 15 billion dollars that would have been available for all of this stuff that we're talking about today. So, how do you make sense out of this? Well, out of the blue came this book, and this book was wonderful. This book was what happened under Margaret Thatcher for 20 years. And there were more crime, there was car accidents, there was a greater gap between rich and poor, reading scores went down. And I figured, whoa, this is like home movies. You know, living in Mike Harris's Ontario, seeing what was happening in Ottawa. And the issue was that, wow, not only was uh, this stuff written in 1996, but Canada had produced the Ottawa Charter in 1986, that Margaret Whitehead in 1991 had come up with the rainbow model that had been adopted by the European Union as, as shaping public policy. The World Health Organization came out in 1997 with this uh, document. And uh, clearly, all of them pointed to the role of public policy. The only problem we have is, I was a psychologist for 30 years, I never heard the word public policy. Nobody takes public policy seriously unless you get a degree in political science. And it's all about public policy. And it's not only about which issues are now public. For example, right now, if you're a woman, you have a kid, what you're going to do with that kid if you go back to work is an individual issue. Everywhere else in the developed world, it's a public issue. And of course, it's related to a set of values. So this stuff comes in, Richard's book comes out. Let's get the message out. And pluralism is a theory, luckily my wife uh, had a degree in political science. Uh, pluralism is what we're taught in school, that we live in an open democratic society, and if we advocate for public policies, governments will do a cost-benefit analysis and come to the conclusion that this is worth doing. So we uh, got the word out. We had a really big conference in 2004. This book came out, uh, all-time bestseller from Canadian Scholars Press. And uh, we got the word out. Unfortunately, as this article summarizes, not much seemed to have happened. In fact, things got a lot worse. So maybe we need another theory, and this is uh, what's called institutionalism. And this is that governments are used to doing things in regular ways, and it takes time to change things. But if we talk to the right people and we lobby, good things will happen. Well, th this is again uh, a little bit of theory. You can buy Toba's book, uh, Societal Institutions Shape and Structure What Policymaking Is, that we have to change the way that people think about issues, and that eventually something will happen. So we came up with the Canadian facts, and actually this thing has been downloaded 550,000 times. You are and I think that for the next edition we're going to charge you 10 cents a copy. In which case, at least we'll be doing okay. 
And indeed, things seem to happen. Uh, I go to iPolitics and I see Bennett says, new government will tackle social determinants of health. But then a couple of days later, young Canadians should get used to precarious employment. And as I said to my students, precarious employment isn't just temporary employment. It's low paid employment. It's lack of training employment. It's lack of benefits. So what do we do? How do you make sense out of all of this? And we also see that uh, Minister Jane Philbot tells her daughter to speak up about the social determinants of health. Speak up, become a, another Ryan Maelli. But then if you go to the Health Canada website, the vision for a healthy Canada is healthy eating, healthy living, healthy mind. So we need another theory. As Kurt Lewin once said, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. What about political economy? What about power? What about political ideology? What about the fact that it would really be nice if a single mom living minimum wage had as much influence on government as the president of the Small Business Federation? But it doesn't seem to work that way. So I'm just going to give you one example. I'm glad to see Unifor is a uh, sponsor of this. Jordan Brennan is now a chief economist at Unifor, and he has a couple of documents. One's called The Shrinking Universe, How Concentrated Corporate Power is Shaping Income Inequality in Canada. And what do you see? Well, basically, the blue line is corporate concentration. And that is how companies are buying each other up and becoming bigger and more influential. And, as Jordan points out, more profitable. And the blue line is, in, is family income inequality. Income inequality is perfectly correlated with the power and influence of big corporations. Now, how that comes about requires another, at least another 15 minutes, which I don't have. So I wrote this article, Beyond Policy Analysis, The Raw Politics Between Opposition to Healthy Public Policy. And you can imagine uh, this is what it's all about. We're all concerned with health outcomes. And of course, we're concerned with health determinants. And we're also concerned with distribution of that. And ultimately, it's about public policy. But it's not just making public policy. That's heavily influenced by the form of the welfare state we have. And it's, it's not the, the most happy things to think about, the relative balance between uh, power, between civil society, organized labor, and the business and corporate community. And when those things go out of whack, society goes out of whack. Now, you can imagine the average public health worker saying, my God, where do I begin with this? Can't I just tell people to exercise and eat fruits and vegetables? And they do. Well, a little bit about power and influence. The governments on the left, the welfare states, are social democratic welfare states. The ones in the middle are conservative European. The ones all the way on the right are Anglo-Saxon liberal political economies. The triangles are child poverty rate. Miraculously, somehow in Scandinavia, there's hardly any child poverty. Is it because they work hard, they, their parents read to them at night, they exercise? Well, it has to do with the fact that pretty well everybody's represented by a collective agreement and pretty well everybody belongs to a union. In the continental countries, it's an ethos that basically we're all in this together. We're all German, we're all French, we're all Swedes. Watch the Michael Moore film, uh, Where to Invade Next. And basically, they do okay in poverty rates, a bit higher. And in the liberal countries, you have weak unions, people don't have collective agreements, and surprise, poverty rates are high. So what do we do? Well, the social democratic countries are marked by coalition building between labor and other sectors. The takeaway message here is more conferences, more statements, more research articles are not going to accomplish anything. You literally have to form interest groups that have power and influence. At the same time, we have to change the way we think about things. In, everybody in Canada recognizes the value of a public health care system, but we haven't 
recognize the value of a public pharma care system, at least the governments haven't. Uh, we don't hear about child care. We don't hear what happens if you lose your job. And basically the conservative countries, and think red Tory, the old red Tories in Canada. Basically this view that we're all in this together, and as you know the CMA came out with a study, we would save billions of dollars with a pharmacare program. Well, according to pluralism, that's a no-brainer. We should have pharmacare tomorrow, but we don't. So what do we do? Quick wins, which again are quick, but not easy. Collective agreements. If you worked under a collective agreement, you'd have higher wages, and the Bank of Montreal would have a bit less profits. Maybe they'd have five billion last quarter instead of six billion. Uh, again, if you have any doubt about the health of corporate Canada, pick up the Globe and Mail business section. We have to also communicate to Canadians the need to distribute risk across the population. And the research literature is very clear internationally, comparatively. You can't do this stuff locally. It requires the institution of left political power. And you can ask me what that means during the question period. So, it's about politics. Uh, the famous political economist uh, Laswell says, politics is who gets what, when, and how. How does that sound for a moniker to put on uh, social determinants of health? That's what it's all about. Change the system. I won't go into the issue of proportional representation, but one of the real uh, stimuli to progressive government in Scandinavia was the introduction of proportional representation early in the 20th century. And we all know where that's going in Canada. However, I want to point out that it isn't just a problem of what we're not doing. There, are, there is opposition out there. And uh, this is a wonderful quote that we have this crisis, the old is dying but the new cannot be born. In the interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Uh, the good news is Stats Canada puts this report out. The bad news is nobody knew about it. I found it by accident. And once we found it, it was really something. I mean, so what happened was we basically summarized this from upstream in one little graphic that 40,000 Canadians were dying prematurely each year because they weren't as healthy as the wealthiest 20% of Canadians. At the same time, you have lifestyle drift and other diversions. And what do I mean by that? This is not a little tiny institute out there. These guys had a budget of two and a half million dollars. And to show you how influential they are, when I go to the upstream website, I don't see Justin Trudeau there. But I do see Justin Trudeau. And what's the the, the, the takeaway, here we are saying, and let's say the Inuit presentation, things are really bad. We got to change things. We got to improve working conditions. We got to improve the conditions of people in the North. We have to improve the conditions of women. And what's the campaign slogan here? Don't change much. So if you're a man, and you can imagine telling, taking this back with you to the North, breathe deeply. Sleep more, walk more. And of course, all those guys are white and they all live in these magnificent houses. We have to deal with that. So luckily, me and my students are exposing this. We're writing articles. But there's a reason these people are so well-funded and supported. So uh, that's my 15 minutes. I'm not sure how long I went. But again, uh, the worse things get, the more there is to write about. And that's what the UK research has learned during the Thatcher years. So the Canadian facts is sitting on, online. As it turns out, health and illness is out there. Uh, if you're going to really take this stuff seriously, you have to buy the, the mother of all social determinants of health books. And uh, that is uh, the third edition. And it has everything. And if you really are serious about public policy change, you've got to understand health policy. You've got to understand how this stuff all works. And uh, anybody have a European Union passport? Well, this woman can get up and move to Norway. 
Unfortunately, most of us can't, but at least we can get an idea of what happens in different places. And finally, because I live in Toronto and uh, the cab drivers are really well educated, uh, we went out and we did an edited book on uh, immigration and public policy. But uh, it would be really nice to think that all we have to do is have the media pick up this conference, uh, send the tapes off to government and good things will happen, but it doesn't work that way. So I'm not going anywhere in terms of where I am and uh, I know where everything's hidden and buried and uh, that's what I've learned after 21 years. Thank you.